Hello, I'm Adrian Monk in New York. Thank you all for joining us today for this special agenda dialogue on the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. This dialogue comes almost one month into the war, an unfortunate milestone in this ongoing tragedy. Each day over the past four weeks, we've seen pictures of the devastation, watched footage of communities destroyed, and read harrowing accounts of the lost lives. It's vital that we continue to bear witness to what's unfolding in Ukraine, but also that we take action to assist those in need. This is why the forum has brought together the heads of leading humanitarian organizations to walk us through what's taking place on the ground and share ways that the public and the private sectors can support the humanitarian response. With us today, Executive Director of the UN World Food Program, David Beasley, Executive Director of UNICEF, Kathy Russell, Deputy High Commissioner of the UN Refugee Agency, Kelly Clements, and the CEO of Save the Children, Inga Ashing. Thank you for joining us. Leading today's discussion is my colleague and President of the World Economic Forum, Berger Brenda. Berger, handing the floor to you. Thank you, Adrian, in New York. Uh, good afternoon from uh, Geneva. Mm -hmm. Indeed, we are really at the moment a uh, few of us could have imagined only weeks ago. When you look at the pictures of destruction of hospitals, airports, schools, cities, it's a tragedy. What is happening in Kiev, Kharkiv, Mariupol, Odessa, and elsewhere is truly shocking. Since February 24th, over 3.3 million people have fled Ukraine for neighboring countries. This comes on top of the nearly 6.5 million Ukrainians that are now IDPs, internally displaced. As the UN uh, High Commissioner Filippo Grande said the other day, he has rarely seen anything like this in such a rapid, unfortunate development. In addition to the humanitarian crisis, uh, the International Monetary Fund, uh, IMF, uh, warned uh, that the global economy will slow as we feel the effects of rising prices on food, fuel, and other essentials. And we can just imagine what consequences this will have also on poverty and extreme poverty. If we don't turn this, we will be nowhere close to meeting uh, the SDGs by 2030, eradicating all extreme poverty. So in, re in response to the crisis, uh, teams from the UN and aid organizations have been working 24-7 to provide life-saving support on the ground. This is crucial. But access is more questionable. And uh, Russia is not, uh, at, of course, uh, complying with basic humanitarian law in this respect. And we have seen a, unprecedented, uh, fortunately, support then from also the business uh, community, not only have our 400 global companies at the uh, World Economic Forum withdrawn from Russia. Hundreds are raising funds or using their networks to directly assist those in need. But there is so much more we must do. So I'm very pleased to have um, such um, a good uh, cost of the leading humanitarians in the world with us. And let me uh, start with the Kathy uh, Russell, Executive Director of uh, UNICEF. Um, we know uh, UNICEF is dealing with uh, the most vulnerable among us um, children. And there are 7.5 million children in Ukraine, 1.5 million of whom are no refugees. I know, Kathy, that you recently returned from the region. And uh, could you give us a sense of what is taking place on the ground and share the impact of the crisis on the children and their families? Thank you for joining. Great. Well, thank you, Berger, for focusing your first question on children, because I think the war in Ukraine is most definitely a child protection crisis. So I'd like to make a couple of points uh, first here today. As you noted, the war continues to escalate in multiple locations. Some cities are completely besieged at this point. And we've all seen the pictures. Nothing is safe from attack and nothing is sacred. Schools, kindergartens, orphanages, maternity hospitals, water systems, 
power plants, theaters, unexploded, unexploded ordinances, and mines now litter communities where children used to play and go to school. Dozens of children have been killed and wounded. The UN can verify uh, 64 child casualties, and that number is likely to grow at this point. Inside Ukraine, children and their families are hiding in basements and sheltering in train stations. Millions have little or no access to safe water uh, or adequate sanitation and hygiene, and millions of children obviously are out of school. Food insecurity is growing, even if food is available, and it's not safe to go outside and buy it. Uh, and it may be the first day of spring, but it's still very cold in Ukraine at this point. UNICEF and our partners are doing everything we can to reach children and families in Ukraine. We have a Ukraine count country office there, and it remains operational under very difficult circumstances. I've been in touch with the staff there, uh, and they're doing truly heroic work, and there's no other word for it. And ensuring their safety and security is our highest priority, and I keep saying that to them. You know, I know how important the work is. I know how dedicated you are, and these people are truly amazing, but please try to keep your safety top of mind. It's a very, very tough operating environment. Humanitarian access is limited with rapidly changing front lines, uh, making it very challenging to deliver critical services and supplies. But we are getting things through. As of March 17th, we dispatched 85 trucks carrying 858 tons of emergency supplies to support children and families in Ukraine and neighboring countries. And just this past week, we delivered supplies across Ukraine to the war-affected cities of Kiev, Kharkiv, and Sumy. So the supplies these trucks are carrying paint a real picture of the situation on the ground in Ukraine and in the neighboring countries. Surgical supplies, oxygen, oxygen concentrators, obstetric equipment and midwifery kits, maternity kits, family hygiene kits, diapers and disinfectants, dignity kits for menstruating girls and women, bottled water, blankets, water, and clothes. Around 34 of these trucks are already inside Ukraine uh, and more are on the way. Outside Ukraine, the refugee crisis has grown so rapidly and exponentially, and so have the risk to millions of women and children on the move. Half of the three million people, as you mentioned, have been forced to flee Ukraine, Ukraine or children. We estimate that 55 children flee Ukraine every single minute, and that's nearly one child every second. I was recently on the border, as you mentioned, uh, of your Romania, where almost half a million people, mainly women and children, have crossed to escape the violence. They're traveling with next to nothing, as you can imagine. The children have their little backpacks on. The mothers are usually dragging a roller or roller bag behind them. Some of them really only have the clothes that they were managed, managed to uh, grab before they left. The women talked about the difficulty of their journeys and their concerns for their children's safety. The children talked about really being pulled out of school and mostly about missing their dads and the worry for their fathers. So the children have been traumatized already, and we know that that's just going to continue. The women and children are vulnerable in so many ways, including to exploitation and abuse, uh, which is one of our primary concerns at this point. The threat of trafficking is real and growing, um, especially for children who become separated from their families. UNICEF and UNHCR are setting up safe spaces for women and children at border crossings and reception and transit areas in all the neighboring countries. These are things we call blue dot areas. You may have seen them in some of our uh, uh, work that we've put out around the uh, social media. Um, they provide information, psychosocial support, and protection from exploitation uh, and abuse, among other critical services. And critically, Blue Dots uh, work to identify and protect un unaccompanied children, which, as I said, is one of our primary concerns. Our response in neighboring countries is focused on supporting the governments to expand their existing social services to women and children fleeing Ukraine. The generosity and compassion we're seeing in these neighboring countries is encouraging. We're grateful that so many refugee families have been able to find temporary housing and help. But I have to really stress, this is not a permanent solution. I just uh, spent a couple days in Germany, and you know the, the sort of longer-term issues are very present in people's uh, minds, and I think we've got to be very mindful of that. Um, I want to conclude my answer with two images. Some you may have seen on social media. In one image, empty baby strollers lie in a square in Lviv, a brutal reminder of how many children have been casualties of this war and how many families have been shattered by what's gone on. In the other image, empty baby strollers have been left at the curb outside a train station and transit points in neighboring countries to help women fleeing the war and their children. 
one image is obviously one of despair, right, of all the children who've been lost so far. And the other is an image of compassion, but neither is an image of peace. UNICEF and our partners will keep doing everything we can to support Ukraine's children and families. But really, what these children need is for the war to end and for there to be peace. So thank you so much, Bjorn. No, thank you, uh, Kathy. Thank you for what you're doing and UNICEF is doing. It is terrible to see uh, that uh, children are uh, being attacked like this uh, in a war in the 21st century. It's just yeah. totally unbelievable. So, and we know also uh, that there is shortages in every way now uh, in Ukraine, being medicine, but also food. And we have David um, Beasley with us, Executive Director for World uh, Food Program. And uh, we know, David, that already before Russia's invasion, food prices jumped by almost 25% over the past year, with wheat prices now um, hitting record high uh, since the crisis started. So can you uh, paint a picture of what this, uh, what is really taking place in Ukraine with regards to the food situation and also why this will have such um, impact uh, around uh, the world? Because we know that uh, both Russia and Ukraine are major exporters uh, of food. You know, just when you think it can't get any worse, uh, it does. I mean, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, a food and fuel price spiking taking place. We were already hit, and I'm sure UNICEF and UNHCR are the same thing. We were already hit right before uh, Ukraine crisis with a $42 million increase in operational costs. We were already billions of dollars short for Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, Ethiopia, the Sahel. Now, let me just go around the world. And so and then when you think it can't get worse, here comes Ukraine. And the difficulty here is that Ukraine grows enough food to feed 400 million people on planet Earth. So when the farmers on the battlefields aren't planting or aren't harvesting, what impact do you think that's going to have? 50% of our grain, for example, wheat, comes from Ukraine. And then when you start putting in the global context of Russia and Ukraine together, not even get into the fertilizer costs and the fertilizer uh, access of base products, you've got a catastrophe knocking and looming on the door for the fall uh, that will be not a price issue, but a supply issue, availability of food for people around the world. And that will be a catastrophe on top of a catastrophe. But in the meantime, inside Ukraine, the people that are making it to the outside uh, in some ways are the blessed and fortunate ones because of the fact they are getting shelter and food in, the, in this miserable circumstance. But you've got 40 million people left on the inside that if we don't reach them with the support they need, including food and medicines, et cetera, you're going to have havoc beyond anything we've ever seen before. We know we are dealing with millions of people on the inside that need support and how do we reach them? How do we get to them given the dynamics that we are facing? It's, it's so bad. It's just hard to imagine what we're facing. We need, for example, just the World Food Program to reach 3 million people, about $160 million per month. We now have $141 million committed and to move the supplies in, you need to reach three, four, five million people. You don't do that in three or four days' time. We don't now have the money to buy for the, month, the end of the month of April. So we're short of funding, as well as what we're trying to do in addition to the Ukrainian government, uh, Boy, is particularly when you know how much grain, barley, wheat, uh, sunflower oils, et cetera, that are produced on the inside of Ukraine, how can we maximize the consumption of those grains inside Ukraine? Because every grain we bring from the outside to the inside is compounding not just on, on what's taking place inside Ukraine, but on the outside as well. So every bit of grain of value that is on the inside that we can use as we work with the government to see what they can do, what can we do. We're setting up distribution points all over the country because the incredible support from especially Poland and the European community where those that are making it to the border has been remarkable. Those that make it to Lviv and on the western side is quite remarkable. We're actually able to say, okay, we don't need to do much here. Let us make certain that we're setting up systems in place where 
hard to reach, besieged cities, can't get into, what do we need to do to deconflict those areas so that we can get the foods, the medicines, and the sport that Kathy was talking about for children, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I could go on and on, and I know we don't have that much time, but you can see we're all hands on deck as we speak. I've been into the region already three times just in the last three weeks, and we'll be there back again later this week. But uh, I don't see it getting any better. I think it's only going to get worse. And uh, all of us coordinating, I know I see Kelly on the line, how we're coordinating with uh, UNHCR, for example, in Moldova right now, because Moldova is going to be gravely in the line of fire, and it's going to be a very tenuous situation for, for the people of that nation. That's just another example of the ripple effect, and, and we go on and on. But, but Lord, let me say thank you to the European community, how they've embraced and, and literally with an incredible love your neighbor perspective have helped a lot of people uh, that have come across. But we cannot forget about uh, the 40 million that need our help now. And let me give this one little last anecdotal dynamic. We did this in Syria. It didn't reach the Syrian people. For every Syrian inside Syria that we at the World Food Program could reach for 50 cents a day, that same Syrian ends up in Berlin or Brussels, it's over $70 per day. So do the math. Uh, it is quite expensive. So we need to reach people that are not in harm's way in such a way that we maximize their hope and bring as much support as we possibly can. And uh, let me just stop right there. Yeah, I can keep on going. So <laughs> thanks for bringing this uh, really important time discussion up. No, thank you for your uh, leadership, David. And as you said, it is when you don't think it can get any worse, it does get worse. And with the multiple crises that you are faced with, uh, being no Ukraine, but we had Afghanistan, we had Yemen, uh, we have Ethiopia, uh, we have Somalia, and we have Sudan and uh, other crises uh, too. So uh, it's natural then to uh, go to uh, Kelly Clements, as you already mentioned, uh, Deputy uh, High Commissioner at uh, UN uh, Refugee uh, Agency. Uh, Kelly. I think you speak to us today from the European Humanitarian Forum taking place in Brussels. And uh, what are you hearing regarding the unprecedented refugee flows from Ukraine into neighboring countries? What are the conditions uh, they're faced with? And if you could also touch on the IDP situation inside Ukraine. Sure, sure. Thanks very much for having us on the program. And really just to, to take off from your opening, Borge, in terms of what Filippo Grandi said not too long ago, he called it a torrent of misery. Um, being there at the border, Dave has just described it, Kathy has described it. You know, we have a situation where people are, are, are really pouring out of the country. Those are the ones that can reach safety. Um, you mentioned the numbers. We basically have a quarter of Ukraine displaced, either displaced internally or they have become refugees leaving and going mostly to neighboring countries who have been phenomenal with their generosity, their humbling hospitality. Um, and really in terms of the numbers that we're talking about, it's, it's, it's huge. So six and a half million internally displaced now, 3.4 million who are refugees, mostly in neighboring countries. And to get to a point that David just mentioned, 13 million we estimate who are stranded or trapped in areas of Ukraine where they can't reach safety. Um, and this is most troubling. Those are the people, of course, we, we can't get the food, the water, the immediate necessities to. So in terms of those people coming to the border, uh, Kathy really set the stage and the scene for you. Most are women, children, and the aged. 90% in many refugee situations like this, you'd already have the, the vast majority who would be women and children. But this is an extraordinary crisis where really we do not see uh, men coming across the border for obvious reasons. Now, what does that mean? It means that refugees want to stay close to Ukraine. They want to stay close to their fathers, their brothers, uh, their nephews, their sons. Um, what does that mean, of course, for the neighboring countries? Well, that the local authorities, the municipalities, the volunteers, people who are really literally opening up their hearts and their homes to be able to host uh, refugees in very large numbers. In places like Moldova, as David just mentioned, a, a country which, of course, has seen a lot of refugees come to this very small uh, country, many people then moving on to, to other hosts like Romania. In Poland, 
We have over 2 million Ukrainian refugees in Poland now. Um, and obviously the, the, the needs for support and services are immense. Now what the European Union has done, and, and yes, as you, as you mentioned, I'm here in Brussels today for the European Humanitarian Forum. They have put together something called a pr temporary protection directive, which basically means that for a period of time, Ukrainians and others that were in Ukraine can seek the protection, the residency, the ability to be able to access services in the country in which they find themselves. So this kind of solidarity, which of course for, for the European Union is critical right now, they are on the front lines of this, but also other countries are establishing similar mechanisms. Canada, the United States, Brazil have all talked about about this and this will be absolutely essential for the long term and moving from an immediate humanitarian response to something that is is more dignified where people can take care of themselves and receive less from the international community but sustained support is absolutely fundamental no thank you so much and, uh, just imagine a country after a few weeks with six and a half million uh, internally displaced people two million people <laughs> only in uh, Poland refugees and uh, the solidarity and how they're coping with it uh, also with your support is, is just um, so so uh, touching. Uh, moving uh, to Inger Ashing. Uh, Inger is the CEO of uh, Save the Children and I know that you have operated in Ukraine uh, since 2014 when we saw the first destabilization um, the occupation of Crimea, but also what we know from Donetsk and Lugansk. And uh, uh, I guess you still have colleagues uh, in uh, Ukraine. I wonder what they're reporting from the ground in terms of the changing needs and uh, the humanitarian access and, and what, what children are faced with uh, just now. Thank you, thank you, Borge. Yes, we still have uh, teams in Ukraine, uh, in the neighboring countries, uh, to make sure that we are responding uh, to this crisis that we see. Um, and as, as we all know, millions of children in Ukraine are in grave danger. And our teams and, and the partners that we work with within the countries are witnessing a major protection crisis unfold. Inside Ukraine, they report that children have started to show signs of severe emotional distress. Some children say that they have become afraid of any noise, feel terrified at all time, and struggle to breathe when they think about what is happening around them. Children are seeing their schools and hospitals being destroyed. They are exposed to the devastating effects of explosive weapons in populated areas, and some are being separated from their families. And that's it, are, of course, in Ukraine, as we just heard, if, if they are able to to escape and flee the country that they are separated from, from the, the, the fathers. And we are extremely alarmed by reports that bombs and intense shelling have damaged more than 460 schools across the country and over 60 now lay in complete ruins. Schools should be a safe haven for children, not a place of fear, injury and death. Urban areas across Ukraine have been repeatedly shelled, reducing complete streets to rubble. The streets of Ukraine are being used as a battlefield. And our team speak of there being no safe places left in the country now. And, and we heard that at least one in five children in Ukraine, uh, more than 1.5 million, have been fleeing the country. And in neighboring countries, we are seeing a huge number of children among these coming across borders, a significant number of them being under 14. And we are especially concerned about children traveling alone who are at extremely high risk of abuse, trafficking and exploitation. And in light of these spiraling needs, it is essential that an unimpeded humanitarian response is able to reach families at the speed and the scale required, and that is incredibly difficult right now. Although some of our partners have managed to remain operational in Ukraine, the situation is volatile and the ongoing hostilities have severely restricted access to some conflict-affected communities, leading to accumulation and exacerbation of unmet needs. So, yes, Berger, there, there, there's a lot of, of things to be really concerned about. But what we're also see, uh, seeing, and we heard some of my colleagues talking about neighboring countries and the generosity and, and that we are seeing, but I'm also overwhelmed by the generosity and rapid reaction of business leaders and the public around the world. Uh, and and uh, th there's a lot of, of, of important roles that they can play. And... I think the task ahead is to collectively support these children, meeting the immediate needs and safety of each individual child and ensuring their long-term protection. 
Because the rules of law are very clear. Children are not the target, and neither are hospitals or schools. We must protect the children in Ukraine. No, thank you so much, uh, Inger. And I'm, I'm just wondering what it takes for someone to bomb more than 100 schools. This is supposed to be the safe place uh, for children and uh, children's hospitals. It is uh, really, really uh, unseen. This is happening in, in Europe in the 21st century. And based on this, I think we're all, um, uh, Kelly, thinking about how can we, in the most effective way, for governments, business, and the public to support the refugees in the middle of uh, this uh, crisis. Of course, uh, we're in the middle of the crisis now, but also, as you mentioned, uh, it's um, going to continue um, for a, a long time. So how are neighboring states uh, planning to support these many refugees and uh, also those yet uh, to arrive? I think we all would like to know how we, uh, in the best way, can support. Thanks. Thanks very much for the question. This is critical. Inger just said it. We have seen incredible generosity and outpouring of support. And if we can say one thing and leave one thing with you, please let this not be temporary. We will need long-term sustained support, not just for this crisis, but as David said, for the many other refugee displacement crises around the world that continue, unfortunately, uh, to not receive the support that it needs. So there are about five ways that we would we would say that businesses can support the governments, the municipalities, organizations like ours. First and foremost, of course, it's it's resources, it's it's funding, it's it's money, things that are as flexible as possible because we need to be able to move very quickly depending upon where those pockets uh, and access opens up inside Ukraine, but also where refugees move in the neighboring countries to be able to move with them and to be able to support the governments and the municipalities that are on the front lines of this crisis. Second is in kind. It's everything from matches, mattresses to beds to blankets to sanitary supplies. All of that is required. Refugees, the Ukrainians, third country nationals, students, they are leaving the country with very, very little. Uh, as Kathy said, the roller bag, there's not much that can fit in there. So really trying to be able to provide some immediate support in terms of that in kind, including lift support in some, in some context. But also we're setting up very quickly uh, a multi-purpose cash system so that they can then have a safe way to be able to move and seek accommodation. The third are for companies. In engage your employees. Lots of people want to help right now. And many companies are taking advantage of that opportunity to be able to channel the support in ways that assist organizations like ours to be able to deliver that relief on the ground very, very quickly. And fourth, many companies are also doing a matching uh, competition, which obviously raises increased resources, gets people engaged. Fifth, the pro bono support we've seen from several companies in terms of adding their expertise, their legal advice, their technological uh, answers when we need some help, particularly in trying to be able to put that, that cash system in place very, very quickly. We couldn't have done it without business. And then the final p point I would make, uh, Borge, on this is use your voice. It's the advocacy. It's talking about why we should care as an international community and why we need to stand together with people in need right now and for the future. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kelly. Uh, it is really heartbreaking uh, to see uh, the children. And uh, Kathy, uh, we know that uh, uh, UNICEF is uh, very, very engaged. And uh, I would also like to post the question to you, what are the most effective ways that governments and businesses can support um, the children, those in particular uh, needs, the re refugees, uh, including <coughs> educational, psycho, uh, social, and mental health needs, because we know that there are scars with these children that they will bear uh, the rest of their lives, and we really, really know uh, need uh, support uh, in the best and most targeted way. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right, Borga. And I, I would agree with Kelly. I think that the international response 
to the situation has been immediate and and governments have stepped up so dramatically and been very uh, responsive and so have local communities in the neighboring countries. Um, but the private sector has stepped up rapidly as well, which has been very reassuring and greatly appreciated because these needs just continue to grow by the day. Um, and as you, as you said, this includes the needs for psychosocial support. Um, children living, living through these uh, experiences are just experiencing traumatic events every day. And that includes, um, you know, not just the shelling, which kids have certainly heard, or hiding in um, the uh, subway stations or, you know, traveling, leaving, leaving their fathers or whatever. It's just a lot of different uh, situations that are very hard to sort of uh, judge how that impact will last on these kids. Um, inside Ukraine, we're deploying 47 mobile units to reach children, which is, you know, important and valuable, but it's, it's of course, a drop in the bucket. Uh, considering the needs. And we're trying to do that wherever these children are and provide them with supports. And in neighboring countries, uh, as I, I mentioned, the Blue Dot Centers um, are also focused on child protection and support. Um, we're also scaling up child protection hotlines uh, for members of the general public to call when they see a child at risk. And that's particularly saying, you know, if you see a child who's alone or uh, gives you any, any worry, um, you know, as I said, people are... Um, and, and Kelly mentioned this, the local communities are being very generous, but sometimes and inevitably in those situations, there are people who don't have good intentions at heart, and we have to really be aware of that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're asking people to use digital and social media to help uh, identify situations where children may be at some risk from trafficking and other dangers. We're also scaling up education support. Um, the, child, the pandemic has really shown us how profoundly crises can impact children's education and how important it is to try to reach them quickly. The interesting thing about Ukraine is that much of their um, education system is digitally available. So we're trying to provide materials and support to prevent learning loss. Again, challenging given the circumstances, but at least if we can try to have some continuity for the students, I think that'll be helpful. We're delivering education kits and early childhood development kits kits in Ukraine and neighboring countries. We're deploying 100 mobile education and early childhood development teams to urgently support children's access to education. And we're encouraging governments to integrate refugee children into national education systems. And this is complicated, as I think Inger and, and Kelly both, both mentioned, because you have situations where the children and the parents hope and believe that the families are going back soon uh, and they don't really want to move into a different um, uh, education system. But of course, we have no idea how long these kids will be there. And it's important to try to make sure that they have some uh, access to the local education systems. So we need to expand these services and all services because uh, every day this war continues. Um, UNICEF's uh, first and foremost is appealing for uh, funds, of course. We are appeal was for $349 million, 276 for urgent programs inside Ukraine, and $73 million for critical efforts in neighboring countries. We're going to need all of that, obviously, for uh, to respond to this crisis in the days and as long as it takes. But we're also calling on the private sector. Companies, particularly those doing business in refugee hosting countries, can help refugee families coping with displacement, for example, by providing access to decent work, uh, especially for people supporting children. Global technology uh, and digital media companies have a footprint in Ukraine and in neighboring countries can help us send real-time information to protect at-risk Ukrainian women and children from being abused, exploited, and trafficked, and that's incredibly important. We welcome support also from the logistics and transport industry to both transport and store critical supplies. Um, we've already been working together on COVID-19 and vaccine distribution, so these folks know us and know our work. Um, with so many children affected in Ukraine and in the uh, and all over the world, our partnership with the transport industry has never been more critical, and we're so grateful for that. And we're calling on all businesses to engage with their staff, their customer base, their business community to push for a peaceful solution to this war and for more support for the children who are caught up in it. So thank you so much. Well, thank you uh, so much. And I, um, you can count also on the World Economic Forum to mobilize all thank our uh, business partners. We had a meeting on Friday with more than 120 CEOs that just wow. joined on Ukraine uh, on a couple of days uh, notice, also at our annual meeting in Davos uh, in uh, May. 
uh, of course, uh, the humanitarian uh, consequences of the war will have a uh, major uh, focus. And I'm thinking about the long-term uh, uh, consequences also uh, for children, uh, of course, the IDPs, but also uh, the refugees. Um, Inger, mm -hmm. um, what, what can we do and, and what do you think we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we will see uh, in the coming uh, months and years uh, here in Europe uh, for these uh, children? Thank you, Berge. So I think in all wars, children are the most vulnerable group um, and losing their protective and secure environments. They are exposed to a number of risks that may have long term consequences on their development and growth, lasting well into adulthood. Uh, adulthood. And I think that is regardless if you're an internally displaced person or, or if you have to fee, flee your country. And I think it's important for us to understand that the nature of conflict has changed, putting children in the front line in new and terrible ways. Wars are lasting longer. They are more likely to be fought in urban areas among civilians, leading to death and life-challenging injuries, and laying waste uh, to the infrastructure needed to guarantee access to food and water, as we just heard. Attacks on schools and hospitals are up. We see all of this happening in, in Ukraine right now. And, and children are dis disproportionate suffering from the consequences of these brutal trends we see many more children facing unimaginable uh, mental and physical trauma. We see more children going hungry, falling victim to preventable uh, diseases, being out of school, the risk of sexual violence, being trapped on the front line with no access to humanitarian aid. And the longer the conflict uh, continues, the worse the situation will be. Uh, and the harm that is done to children in armed conflict is not only uh, often more severe than, than what it is for adults, it has longer lasting implica implications for children themselves and for their societies. You can say that destruction, poverty that comes from war and, and violence creates a vicious circus. And one example, just to illustrate what I'm trying to say, is that the closure of schools not only leaves lifelong scars on education and employment, but it also deprives children of one of the most important protective factors. And the impact that we see in Ukraine now on children's health, both physical and mental, is devastating. But I want to say that children can also demonstrate extreme resilience, even in the most extreme circumstances, uh, particularly if they are getting the right support to, to recover. So there is a real important role for all of us to play to make sure that we support them to be able to, to get to that resilience and, and come out of this uh, without as many scars uh, as if, if they are not supported. And it's about ensuring that children are safe, that their basic needs are being met, families are preserved or reunited, and that alternative care is being put in place and that children have access to community level support such as school. Local and national NGOs will be critical uh, and so will government and the business sector. And we know from experience in other conflict zones around the world that we have to start to planning now for supporting children's long-term recovery from the crisis. Uh, and we know that we need to make ensure that we uh, give access to education as we just heard both Kelly and Kathy talk about. Uh, and I think what will be key now uh, is to make sure that the, the there is a strong commitment from the international communities and business leaders to mobilize new child-focused recovery funding and prioritize investment in human capital by investment in education, healthcare protection, mental health, and psychosocial support. And I think it's, it's key that these is, this, this funding is long-term, that is flexible, and that we are putting children at the center and at the core of the responses to support Ukraine. Well, thank you, uh, Inger, for that incredibly uh, important reminder. Uh, we can't only fo focus on the short-term uh, humanitarian catastrophe. We know that we will need to medium-term, long-term uh, follow up uh, these uh, children. I would like uh, to go back to you, uh, David, David Beasley. Um, we know that uh, the war in Ukraine is putting serious uh, strain on the global food system. And this is having impact all over the world. And um, we know that this food system already was failing nearly 800 million people who are living hunger globally before this crisis. And it has become more urgent than ever to transition food systems so that they are more resilient 
and also more inclusive. So Ukraine and Russia, we know, as I already mentioned, jointly supply nearly 30% of wheat worldwide. So I'm wondering what can the public and private sectors do to prepare for the next harvest and to strengthen the food system over the longer term. So we don't move to a situation where those that had food shortage end up in famine and those that had no problem before are ending up in a um, food uh, situation that is uh, serious. So what can we do? Well, I, I talked with the G7 uh, secretary, ministers of agriculture on Friday and said, uh, the question is, do you have enough time right now to offset what could be a substantial reduction in the availability of grains, uh, wheat, barley, oats, yada, yada, uh, around the world because of what's happening uh, in Ukraine? And this is one of the reasons we need to get the farmers in Ukraine back into the field so they can plant and harvest over the next few months. Otherwise, can the G7 countries and all other nations around the world make up for that supply uh, that needs to be offset from the literally the hundreds of millions of metric tons that will not be available? Because as I said earlier, it's not going to be a pricing problem in the fall or, or a year from now. It's going to be an availability problem, and that has extraordinary consequences. The other thing is while you're focusing on Ukraine, you cannot neglect the Middle East and let's say, for example, from the Red Sea to the Atlantic, the Sahel, Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, because uh, if you do, you could have millions upon millions of refugees heading your way, as we saw in Syria. You cannot neglect this region of the world just for Ukraine. We've got to deal with both and all of this at the same time, because right now, because of lack of money, right before Ukraine, we were already cutting rations, let's say, for example, in Yemen, from uh, 8 million people down to 50 percent and now down to 0 percent in the next week if we don't receive monies. The same thing in the Sahel. We've already cut in Niger and Chad and Ethiopia, et cetera, down to 50 percent rations. How would you like to tell your child, I'm sorry, you're only going to get uh, at best half the food that you need. So you're running into these issues all over uh, the world. And so we can't neglect those other areas. An area that's really critical, though, is export bans. The private sector and the government's got to minimize export bans. The private sector has got to be very careful not to get uh, too speculative in a constrained market. Transparency is going to be critical so we can stabilize the market because we're not just dealing with the, the 125 million people that we may be feeding on every on any given day or month, but we're dealing with 7.8 billion people on Earth that re, re that need uh, and rely on this supply chain systems. Now, one last thing, Morgan, this is extremely important because the long-term answer in these fragile places is not just giving food. I mean, I think all of us would like to put ourselves out of business where we're no longer needed. And this is where the private sector has got to be engaged in countries that may not be at war right now. Yeah, we need your money right now, the short-term uh, perfect storm, but on the long-term, we need your engagement in reducing dependency upon uh, government programs that would just hand out food versus creating resilience, sustainability in ways that when shocks do happen, people can take care of themselves. And we've got these solutions. They do need to be funded. But I've seen an incredible shift in the United Nations in the past few years that, in my opinion, shun the private sector. But you see, I, I think it's a great awakening in the United Nations. We'll never solve hunger. We'll never solve poverty uh, unless the private sector is front and center working alongside. So thank you. No, thank you, uh, David, for that important perspective. Uh, one thing is to bring food in an acute crisis, a humanitarian crisis, but you shouldn't kill uh, the local markets at the same time. Of course, it's different when there is a war zone uh, compared to a natural uh, disaster, but these are very important reminders. Uh, Katya and uh, Kelly, as uh, David uh, just underlined, uh, the crisis in Ukraine is taking place as part of a global crisis. We know that uh, at least 82 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes, 82 million people, and uh, among them are nearly 26 uh, million refugees, and many of them uh, children. So 
Maybe you could share also uh, with our audience uh, what impact this crisis uh, in Ukraine has on Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and other uh, conflicts around the world. How can we continue to support in Ukraine without uh, letting people in, for example, Yemen or South Sudan paying a price for this? Well, Borgia, we just have to. <laughs> we have to not take our eye off of those other crises. You know, for 2022, uh, the global humanitarian overview uh, asked for, you know, a, a record $41 billion for 274 million people. Those, if you combine that with the requirements now that we're seeing in light of the Ukraine uh, situation, the needs, as all of us have said, are going through the roof. And the requirements that we have to continue to meet those needs are also increasing. Last year, we were only half supported as an organization, as the UN Refugee Agency. Um, already this year, we are tremendously worried that resources not be deviated or diverted to Ukraine. This needs to be additional. We need to continue to support Venezuelans, South Sudanese, Sudanese, uh, Yemeni, uh, Somali refugees, and all in, 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 in pockets around the world, global uh, humanitarian need is acute, and we cannot take our eye off of those needs at the same time. Kathy? You know, I think it, it's certainly challenging. The, the world's attention is now on Ukraine, and that's that makes sense, right? It's a it's a terrible situation there, and, and we can see every night on the news what's happening. But um, as as Kelly said, the the problems continue in other places, and I think you know someone gave me a statistic that last year in Syria, nearly 900 children were killed or injured, and that's when you stop and think about it, it's a, it's a devastating number. Um, I was in Afghanistan a couple of weeks ago, and I. I, I was shocked at the at the humanitarian crisis that is happening there, where um, you know so many children. I mean, we're worried that a million children are at risk of acute, severe malnutrition. And you know, I've seen a lot of things in my career, but I had, I visited a hospital where babies were suffering from that um, problem, and it it was. It was uh, it was devastating even for me to see, and I, as I said, I've I've seen I've seen many situations like that before, but it is terrible there, and it's a situation where um, you know you drive down the road and you see carts of vegetables and um, fruit on the side of the road. Uh, they did have a drought last year, so the, the food is more limited, but there is some food in the country, but there's no money in the country because of this banking challenge there. So the international community has got to still be able to focus on other problems at the same time because if we don't you know people children in particular will will suffer and are suffering in these places i did a call the other day with with people from yemen again people are suffering children are suffering from acute malnutrition that's a that's a very horrible way i mean i don't know about you but you know if i'm hungry if i miss lunch i i sort of notice it right and these people are suffering in such a devastating way these little children they can't they go to school they don't have meals they don't you know how are they supposed to concert how are they supposed to get through the day and it's really a horrifying situation and as a as a world we can't let that happen we've got to be able to do more than one thing at a time not just not detracting at all from the crisis in ukraine because it is a serious problem but there are children suffering in many other parts of the world uh, and we've got to be able to focus on that as well and do something about it because we have the capacity to do it and i always say at unicef we know what to do right we know how to address these problems we just need the resources to do it. Thank you so much, um, Kathy. Adrian, uh, what um, uh, strong uh, messages uh, from these uh, humanitarians? Incredible um, testimony, I think, from everyone across the humanitarian leadership sector. And I think um, from David as well and from uh, Inga and some of uh, the colleagues that you brought on, a really important message for CEOs listening that their businesses really do need to have plans to tackle this crisis and that business has a really important role to play in making sure that uh, we can both meet the needs of the people who are suffering and also that we can uh, help them to integrate and rebuild their lives uh, and actually manage through this uh, horrible crisis that we've seen in Europe in uh, the last few weeks. 
Uh, but really, yes, it's been a profound uh, and uh, fascinating insight into the challenges that we face and also into the solutions that present themselves, particularly some of those points. And I think uh, anyone who's watching from any forum partner company can get in touch with their uh, engagement manager and really understand how they can help, what they can do and what their company needs to do to have a plan to tackle this crisis. Back to you, Borga. So thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you to all of you for joining. Thank you for the incredible work you're doing. Uh, also send uh, our warmest uh, thoughts uh, to all uh, the brave humanitarians out there. And also I'm thinking about all those that are suffering under war or natural uh, disasters. But um, we also have uh, to not get paralyzed. We have to roll up our sleeves and really know, uh, support everyone in need and get back on track so we can meet the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. We cannot give up on this because it is possible to fight poverty. It is possible to eradicate all extreme poverty by 2030, but it will take a lot. And these crises are unfortunate, unfortunately uh, historic. So thank you very much for joining us and um, um, uh, all the best from Geneva. Ha <laughs>